absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I kind of want to just, because it's it, a good transition into the, the sauna, the growth hormone yeah, story, yeah, because, yeah. you know, I've, I've been a, a routine sauna user since yeah. about 2009. Yeah. Long time. Yeah. I used to, I mean, I was used to go every day. I mean, All I right. Like, so I, you know, it was like really, <laughs> really, for me, it was like my, in grad school, it, yeah. you know, it just, I would go into the sauna before I'd go into the lab and yeah. it really seemed to help with my yeah. anxiety. It helped yeah. me. So I started yeah. to read about it. It was like, yeah. something's going on here. Right. Sure. And I came into this whole growth hormone literature where I was like, holy crap, you could do like two or three back-to-back -back sauna sessions separated by, you know, five or 10 minutes of cooling. Yeah. And you could get up to like a 16-fold transient yes. elevation yes. in growth hormone. Yes. And so at the time I was thinking, oh, you know, because I had used it so much through periods of injury and yeah. when I usually use, lose muscle mass and yeah. it was very apparent to me. Yeah subjectively speaking, sure. <laughs> that I was not losing muscle mass. And yeah. so at the time, you know, I was like growth hormone, that's it, yeah. because it's, yeah. it's an anabolic hormone, of course. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's, you know, net protein synthesis will be increased. And mm -hmm. turns out I was probably wrong about that part. So yeah, uh, I, yeah. I mean, I, I think uh, the, the way to think about these hormones is, is that when we're kids uh, and we're growing, you need growth hormone to grow. You, you, IGF-1 is a, is a pro-growth factor. Once you're finished, you're, you're linear and uh, you know, sort of broad growth, these, these hormones are, uh, are, are mostly, in the case of growth hormone, it's actually a fat mobilizing hormone. That's it. one of its great side effects if you're taking exogenous growth hormone. You notice you get leaner. Um, it probably doesn't do much for your muscle. Uh, I do think that there's something to the heat exposure probably outside of growth hormone that you know at the local level we're beginning to appreciate that the stress of the sauna so it is stressful it's a thermal stress but I mean it sort of recreates quote unquote mimics some aspects of exercise and we talked about you know hot yoga is one of these these great sort of not only relaxing therapeutic but you're physically active, you're stretching muscles, but you're doing it in the heat. So there's a big thermal stress and your cardiovascular system absolutely is like, wow, we're under, we're under siege here. You know, heart rate goes up, everything else like that. But our muscles begin to turn on what we call heat shock proteins. So these heat shock proteins are, as the name implies, uh, they were discovered when we, people applied local heating. Um, and for a long time, they're like, I don't know what these proteins do, but what we understand now is that they, they chaperone or they act as essentially little, pro, little uh, proteins that bind to other proteins to prevent them from being what we call misfolded. And part of the stress response, and so as the name implies, could be stress due to exercise, could be stress due to sickness, could be stress, due, you know, you name it, um, is that more proteins are misfolded. So, and people, you know, what about misfolded proteins? And I said, well, you know, a protein is a string of amino acids and then it, it sort of bends in on itself and then it does, you know, all kinds of things and it twists into a shape that is its final shape for it to be useful. Um, but sometimes it, it doesn't do that and it does something else. Uh, and let's say it just, it doesn't fold into the shape it should be. And stress proteins help those proteins maintain and get into that appropriate folded structure. So yes, I think you were getting benefits. Uh, I, you know, uh, I don't know that the growth hormone was a big part of it, but definitely the, the, the heat shock protein response is, I think, and we're beginning to see more and more um, that you can alleviate muscle atrophy. And even in some patient groups, with various forms of muscular dystrophy uh, that actually, you know, heating and exercise could have synergistic benefits. So um, again, pulling a, away some of the, the, you know, the covers on this, it's, it's a fascinating area. So, and the other part, and we, we talked about this too, you feel good afterwards. And as I said, at the top levels of athletic performance, like the feeling good part is you can't undervalue that. Even if the physiologist go, ah, there's nothing to it. And the athlete says, I feel good, yeah. right? And the physiologist goes, oh, okay. Well, you know, you scored three goals last night. So what could, who am I going to, you know, I can't argue. Yeah. So I, feeling I'm, good is big. It is. I, yeah. I'm glad you brought up the heat shock proteins because that, um, to my credit, I did publish a review 
Okay. All right. Last August, yeah, where there you go. talked all about the heat shock proteins Bravo. being responsible yeah. for the, the the preventing and mm -hmm. you know much muscle atrophy. With you know, there's been animal studies yep. that I had cited many you know many years ago, yep. and um, they've been sort of redone in a sense in some local applied heat therapy mm -hmm. studies where they're preventing you know atrophy from disuse. Yes. And so the, again, back to this elderly population. So I've been able to get my mother in the sauna. I have yeah. a sauna and. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's only so much you can do with someone who has not spent their entire life being physically active. Correct. And I find that it's easier to get her in the sauna, and so I am mimicking to some degree yeah. a little bit of moderate aerobic yeah. exercise. Yeah. And then hopefully also getting some heat shock proteins mm -hmm. to help with muscle atrophy, yeah. which she's battling, everyone, you know, as we're Absolutely. getting older, are battling. So, yeah. um, it's really nice to hear that you said that on the, on the feel, depression. I'll send you my article. You'll, sure, you'll, sure. you'll read it, but yeah. there's a whole yeah. section because, uh, there's been a, a a sham controlled trial looking at the effects of heat stress on a major depressive disorder. Right. There was a sham controlled. Yep. Sort of yeah. And yep. basically it had an antidepressant effect. And um, I'm working now, I'm collaborating with um, someone, I'm a small collaborator, I'm the mm -hmm. biomarker person. Yeah. But um, Dr. Ashley Mason, she's at UCSF, yeah. she's now running a awesome. large, yeah. more large uh, randomized yeah. controlled trial on this. And so um, that's in the, in the works right now. But, but the thermal stress side of things, you wonder, you know, so here's exercise, there's thermal stress, but there's muscular activity. So you're talking, I'll call it passive thermal stress. I mean, they must cross over. And so right. would it be surprising that, you know, one sort of mimics part of what the other does? And so, yeah. So I, I have a question for you because as I was reading some of your reviews, um, something that came up was, you know, looking into the causes of sarcopenia, the mm. many causes. Yes. Um, but, but even down to like looking at the molecular and the muscle tissue level, mm -hmm. there was this degradation or a, a proteostasis. Yeah. The, the, the basically proteostasis was messed up yes. in type two, was it type two muscle fibers? Yep. And I was wondering if the heat shock proteins in sauna may play a very specific role in countering that type of so if you'd asked me that and, and and here's where you know never stop learning uh begins uh even three or four weeks ago i would have had to say you know i'm not really sure uh, i had the pleasure of attending the international biochemistry of exercise conference in toronto um so it wasn't it was an easy one for me to get to um just two weeks ago uh, and there was discussion about this sort of heating aspect of things and, and heat shock protein uh, response and what it could do is in, in terms of a protective measure against atrophy and maybe it's important. And it was in the context of um, somebody who was talking about the benefits of exercise for people with various forms of dystrophy. But, you know, let's just say it's muscle loss and, you know, the heat protein, uh, the heat shock protein response as in the role that I described as a chaperone protein, but also in other ways that we're probably not understanding as well, um, could be beneficial. And I, I definitely do, wouldn't want to dismiss that. Uh, I do think that there is uh, enough evidence to, to be at least interested and raise your eyebrows and say, this is deserving of, of, of greater and deeper study. Uh, so again, uh, like I said, honestly, three or four weeks ago, I'd be like, I, I don't know, but I heard a, a great exchange between a former mentor of mine and a good friend who is an extraordinarily bright individual, and they both sort of nodded and thought, you know what, this is something that there's something going on. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. Uh, we're all still learning. So yeah, never say never. Yeah, I mean, if if you ever want to, um, I you know, I got Dr. Duari Lakanen. He's in Eastern yeah. Finland. Um, he's a he's a friend of mine, yeah. and you know, he's got lots of samples and looking for collaborators always. So there's wow. you know, lots of possibilities cool. there because yeah. I I would love to sort of connect people and try to you know yeah. ask the right questions and and see if we can answer them. I mean, that would be well. It, it's an interesting one to answer because it seems that the heat shock response is something you can locally induce, right? It doesn't have to be a sauna, so you can heat one leg and not the other leg, for an example. Like so, these are. These are always the things that kind of pop in my mind. I'm like, how could we study that in the most efficient way possible? Do we need to put people in the sauna? Not that that wouldn't be good, right. but it's maybe we could way. do local heating. And, and, and again, uh, the, the, the cardiovascular effects to do with that and opening up capillaries and so more perfusion of them. I mean, the, the, there's all kinds of things that are suggestive that there could be something going on there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah.